you guys did in Manchester in June and there's like this one song you do by Paul Simon and oh yes I do it for your love for your love yeah and yeah. It, it got me just thinking uh, just starting this talk with with a question you know I, I checked I have you on so many albums and I've checked what you've done your repertoire mm -hmm. it's quite uh vast and unusual <laughs> yeah it's not you know like usual it's like jazz standards, but you, you, I love what you do. You know, you're like Dave Grusin, you do Madonna, you do your stuff, Kenny Wheeler, Ralph Towner, Experto Gismonti, like everyone. And what triggers the choice of what you decide to take it throughout uh, these years and how has it changed maybe, if it has? I mean, Well, I mean, that particular tune, I Do It For Your Love, um, that was suggested by, by Nikki Isles' oh. pianist because I'm in, I'm in her group called The Printmakers. And we actually recorded that on an album um, called Westerly. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it's a six piece group you know, with uh, guitar, uh, saxophones, bass, drums, piano and me. And uh, <clears throat> we all love Bill Evans. And I think I wouldn't have known about that tune if Bill Evans hadn't recorded it. <laughs> You know, mm. it's Toot Seelemans is on that album. I forgot what the album's called, but, um, and just loved what he did. I mean, it's a, it's a great piece. Yeah, I'm not quite sure beautiful. I really understand the words. And that's, and that's um, unusual for me to sing words. I, I, I like the sound of them anyway. You know, it's like also singing um, Here Comes the Flood, you know, that Peter Gabriel one. The words are kind of, <laughs> out but I like them they feel good to sing and um and I think that's that's fine but I don't know what I think usually it's um harmonies I mean things which already have lyrics I think they have to have a good harmonic structure mm. and of course the lyrics have to be appealing in some way um when I write words it's maybe a bit different, you know, but you have a piece, you know, I've been attracted to pieces, say by Egberto Gismonti and Ralph Towner, yep. Steve Swallow, and, um, and and they they might somehow the musical speak to me and I'll think of words, but um, I mean, I don't, I, I, I started to write lyrics because I wanted to expand the repertoire from yeah. standards and I didn't really know anybody that was writing lyrics much at that time and I thought well I'll try and I found that I could do it <laughs> I really like it. Um, where, where, where did you find the inspiration I and mean, where do you to write lyrics like, do you go like you know through I don't know Wordsworth and Coleridge or the American poetic <laughs> heritage or like or do you just it just pops up or well, sometimes it, uh, things just pop up, you know, like I, in um, a timeless place, you know, the Jimmy Rolls tune, the Peacocks yeah. I wrote words for. That took a long time to write because I didn't have a deadline. You know, you have to have a deadline um, to make you finish something. Well, I do anyway. Yeah, and everyone. The, <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. And with that one, I think it was just, I just already had the title, The Peacocks. And so I just started thinking about what kind of a place where you get peacocks. And I thought in England, you get them sometimes in parks, but in homes like these mansions and stately homes. And I just imagined a place and somewhere which I had worked um, with Michael Garrick Trio mm -hmm. some years before was one of these places. It didn't have peacocks, but it was a, a home which was open for the public to go and look. And we did a concert there. And the next day they let us just wander. 
around the house. Mm. And it had its own chapel. It had beautiful gardens. And um, I thought, oh, that, they didn't have peacocks, but it's the kind of place where you might find them. And I just went from this atmosphere of this house and the feeling of, and I kind of imagined a story of uh, a girl involved with this guy that was from the family of the house. And, but he was something like a peacock, you know. <laughs> So everything you but you couldn't get to know him you know and so it, that was a little bit of inspiration from somewhere where I'd been um but sometimes it helps if I have a title even yeah. though I don't keep the title it helps to know what was in the composer's mind perhaps yeah um, and but then I just listen and listen you know I normally have a recording of, of it of something and I listen and listen until words seem to come out not necessarily at the beginning of the tune could be in the middle but i suddenly will find a phrase which um which suits the musical phrase you know i find a phrase of words which suit that musical phrase and then i work outwards from there i don't know how it works really yeah that's interesting yeah for me it's like I, words are like so heavy you, you know i mean i studied literature but like to, to write to write lyrics for me that's like the most intimate for, it's really easy to write a melody or chords for me just when I go to lyrics it's just like oh man it's so cliche like this is like I, well, I, I'm just like Ugh. <laughs> you know hard isn't it hard yeah. not to not to have cliches and also um, with a song it's not really like poetry because with poetry you tend to read and, and over and over again and you can decipher the lyrics and, and perhaps the words and what they might mean. Um, I like things that you can interpret maybe in more than one way. Yeah. Um, but I do use poetry um, as an inspiration sometimes. You know, I have some um, compilations uh, which I use and I, which have poems from everywhere, sometimes for, you know, European, mm -hmm writers that have been translated um, and I sometimes just open the book anywhere and look at the poem and, and I might find a line or yeah. a word I really like um, and and then I, I think oh that's yeah. yeah and it just goes from there so I do find uh, reading poems um, sometimes inspirational um, you know, it's just, if the, but there's some of those people I've no idea, never read any of their other work. Sure. But I, I've just find that I'll, I'll, I'll hear a phrase and I think, ah, oh, that's, that's good. You know, with them, um, when I did, I uh, was recording with the trio with Glauco Venier and Klaus Gasing, and there was a piece called Rao, which was, or Crado, which is a fishing village near where Glauco lives. And I love this piece, this tune. It was a, it's a folk tune, but he reharmonized it. Um, Glauco reharmonized it. Yeah. And I thought, well, I don't know, there's something. So I started looking through things to do with the sea, and I came across a Pablo Neruda poem uh, about a mermaid who gets stranded on the shore. Mm. And uh, I thought, yeah, that's, and, and I had an idea then of, uh, of something I could write about. Yeah, yeah, it's so beautiful that you that. I mean, because if you do your own lyrics, I guess it's a more personal touch for you as a singer than singing still someone yeah. else's lyrics. I guess. I mean, it's hard. I guess. Yeah. It's, well, I, I mean, I do like singing. Other yeah, yeah. Lyrics, sure. If they're good, um, and you can, I don't know, the way you sing something can change. For instance, singing T for two. Um, yeah. You know, if you think of that, uh, da -dee, da -da, da -da, picture me upon your knee. Like someone said to me once, how can you sing that tune with those words? <laughs> and I said, well, I, I think of it as a sad, a, a poignant song. You know, this, this person is just dreaming about what could be, you know. Mm. We will raise a family. Can't you see how happy we could be? Could. Yeah. <laughs> That's the thing. We will thing. be. We could be. Yeah. It probably won't be, but <laughs> so 
so you can you can make all sorts of things work you know i think yeah no yeah i agree i mean no it's, it's beautiful it's just, it's just you know when I, like i said when i listened to 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 your work and throughout the years it's i'm always amazed like by this vast uh, vastness of uh, what you do you know i love that because it's that then it always surprises you're like wow what, what is this then <laughs> you know it's there's like Paul Simon, there's like Madonna, there's you, there's Kenny Wheeler, there's Ralph Downer, there's that. It's like, wow, but really, that's it. And it's all music and it's so beautiful. Yeah. It's, it's, it's funny it's, because I had, um, there was a, somebody who used to introduce uh, jazz programs, mainly like big band and kind of, I don't know, you know, more or less straight ahead stuff. And she, I don't think she could ever understand what I did. And I, I met her once and she said, oh, I heard you the other day. And I thought, what is she doing now? <laughs> it was yeah. like, like, I don't understand it. <laughs> what is she doing now? <laughs> yeah. So uh, that, that's a good, that's like the most, yeah, the, the biggest element, compliment. Element of surprise. <laughs> yeah, I love that. I, I wanted to, speaking of what are you doing now, I, I've read an interview you did last year talking about something with Steve Swallow that. Uh, and yes. is this yes. gonna happen? I did this talk with Steve and uh, we, we talked about how oh, we did it like uh, two months ago. And we talked about Robert Creeley for one hour instead of 20 minutes about jazz. Then later. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, is, what is, well, is this happening or might happen? Or? We want it to happen. He wants it to happen too. It's just, I think he is in a difficult position at the moment. Uh, I think Carla, has not been well and he's mm -hmm. been looking after her oh, man. So, traveling traveling well <laughs> i didn't know whether to say it but i, I can't tell you in any other way oh, sure. why it hasn't happened um he was supposed to come to europe but he felt he couldn't travel and um he said well maybe you have to come here um to new york but he also has to be available to be able to to work and um, ah. but I mean, I, I went just at the weekend, just two days ago. I was in Italy uh, just to play through the material that we want to record with Glauco Venier, who's going yeah. to be on piano on it. And um, it was wonderful because I haven't really sung these things for a long time, many years, and working out ways of different ways of doing them. And also, we we did uh, two of the. Creeley, Robert Creeley. Oh, really? Oh, no, that, wow. uh, that Steve um, recorded at yeah, sure. the last sure. album. Um, and, oh, they're so beautiful. Very short. They re work really well. And and uh, the way Steve wrote the, you know, the, the, the music. music. Yeah, yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah. said the line, the lines you'll find, they more or less fit yeah. the poem. And they do. And uh, so it, that was beautiful to do those, just two very short things, but I'd love to include them. But the rest is just Steve's music and my words. Yeah. Um, and I'm really hoping we can do them. Manfred yeah. Eich wants to do them. Oh, wow. It just depends if we can all get yeah. in the same place. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. of course, with the travel restrictions anyway, it was difficult because we couldn't go, I couldn't go to New York. Um, and I think it was very difficult for him, for Steve, anyway, to travel to Europe. And this, and even now, traveling is so yeah, many I know. Yeah. forms you have to fill in, and you have to do this and do that, and get this vaccination and you know, this test. And I know, yeah. <laughs> um, music is last. We were, than yeah, yeah. we were I'm, but I feel we will do because we really want to do it. You know, Steve has said that how much he wants to do this project. So, you know, Hopefully. once and now it seems that we can travel to America. Yeah. Yeah. We could until now before it was, yeah. 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 So it let's hope it will happen. But um, yeah. everything has been uh, been at a standstill, really. Yeah. We can't yeah. this pandemic it, it was it was bizarre like also when i played last year my first concerts after the first lockdown i felt really like 
really? That's yeah. that's how this is. Yeah. And it was still like only 30% of audience that in there, but it's still and then again another stand still in the fall and winter is like oh, bizarre <laughs> times, really. Yeah. But uh Norma, I wanted to ask you about Glauco. Uh you know, you, you guys been working so much together and he's such an amazing player and uh how did you hook up with him? Was it on that record with Roberto, Dani? I mean, like, he's my friend, really a good friend of mine. He? He, oh, yeah. He... Well, that, that's where I first met Glauco, doing that that album with um, Roberto. Yeah. And, yeah. And um, it was funny because all that music was very free and there's yeah. no, no um, standards or anything or, or even tunes. Um, but in between takes... I noticed sometimes Glauco would be playing and he, and I, I had the headphones on and I'd start singing a song and he'd join in. And um, so I thought, oh, you know, he plays other things as well. But then I was asked by an agent um, if I could do a concert with two musicians from Italy. Um, and I said, oh, I don't know, I don't know. I said, I really don't want too much anymore to do, just go and play somebody else's music, yeah. which I did a lot. And um, I mean, it was a great experience, but I felt I did enough of that. So now I just, just concentrate on what I really want to do. And um, he said, I said, so I don't know. He said, he said, you do know the pianist. You worked with him on this album with Roberto Danny. And I said, oh yeah, Glauco Benio. Yeah, I remember him. And he said, well, he has a duo with Klaus Gasing, a saxophone player from Germany. And um, he said, they would, they have some gigs that they would like you to join them. Mm. So that's how that happened. And, and I said, well, okay, but can they play the tunes that I want? So he said, yeah, send them on. So they knew a lot of them because they, they had the azimuth things. Azimuth, they had Sky yeah. called home. And um, so we did, you know, we did a concert. And it, I immediately knew that I could work with them. I just had that feeling that, that we could work together, even though they were very close. They're, they're playing. They played together a lot. Yeah. And it took me a few times to find a way in where I felt, I was not in their way, even though it was, they'd asked me. But um, yeah, and so that was, oh God, I think that was about 1999. Oh, wow. Because, because Glauco said, oh God, he said, I think when I met you first, he said, I was, um, I was younger than, no, yes. He said, you were younger than I am now <laughs> when we first met, 20 well, however many years ago, 23 years ago. Yeah. Um, and of course, it's nobody works, you know, that much, to be honest. If you do what music you like, you probably know it's very hard. Yeah, um, definitely. Yeah. And, uh, but doing some ECM recordings helped a bit, <laughs> a lot. Yeah. And it was just definitely. wonderful to do them, you know, to, to, to have Manfred Eicher as the producer. Yeah. Um, How is it like working with Manfred for you as a vocalist? I mean, you know, because mo mostly it's like, well, mostly it's instrumentalists lately hmm. that he does, but vocals are not so prominent in the ECM catalog. But no. how, how, how was your experience or is working with Manfred already, like the early Azimuth stuff or even now? How does he influence the progress or? Uh, well, he, he does. He, I mean, he has ideas. Um, I always enjoyed it. I know some people sometimes would prefer that they just make all their own decisions about things. But I think to have an outside ear yeah. and an ear like his, which is incredible, um, is good because you can't always judge yourself. You know, what you think, oh, I think that was good. And then maybe you listen, I don't know, six, three months later and you think, oh, no, no, that was not as you know um and and live things are very different from recordings and i think yeah. that manfred Eicher thinks of recordings as um a special entity that recording you know because sometimes he would say things like yeah i think that tune's good for a live performance but maybe not so good oh, for, okay for recording yeah 
Um, but I, I've always found that his, you know, he has ideas when he listens to something and, um, and will say, well, maybe you should leave that out or something. I mean, it's always up to us, but uh, I always have taken notice of what he says because I think he, he's generally right. It's, I mean, you it's good, yeah. Like everything, but um, he has a, a, an idea. Well, you can see with everything about of the, the label, the covers and everything, it's, it's an idea. The whole thing is, is one thing, really. Yeah, yeah. And, um, yeah. yeah, yeah, I agree. Uh, I mean, for instance, so on, uh, I remember doing something, and I was saying a tune of Kenny's and um, Kenny Wheeler's "Winter Sweet," mm. and we changed key after the first chorus, so that Kenny can solo in a key that he's comfortable and sing. And it's difficult to get back to the original key, so I, the idea was I join him in his key, but it was very high. And I was singing that, and Manfred said, "Doesn't say, why are you singing that high?" I said, "Well, because that's the key. It's gone into that key now, and we can't really get back very easily. So if I'm singing, he said, "Yeah, but it doesn't really sound good." I know. He said, "Get Kenny to play with you as you're singing. Solve the problem. Absolutely. It's just the voice needed a little extra." help because it was very high yeah yeah well, I, mean, we, I suppose we could have thought of it but he thought of it um, yeah. and it worked you know I'm not saying that it always would work but yeah i know what i know what you mean it's like yeah. you said it's good to have this in it outside out, outside <laughs> ear yeah you're like involved in the process yeah we need this and then yeah. no nah. or you're in the same zone for 20 minutes already and it's yeah. like well <laughs> maybe go somewhere else now. Or, yeah, that's right. Yeah. But uh, speaking of you being a band leader, it's almost 50 years now since Edge of Time. I, I listened yeah. Yeah. To, to it yesterday <laughs> on YouTube, and it, it's, it's, oh, it, it's amazing how fresh it sounds. Yeah, I mean... And I how open know. it is. I don't know. I, I listened to it, and it's, it's, it's amazing. It's just like... It, it's it sounded so progressive even now if you put it on i mean you have like you know alan skidmore like osborne kenny henry lauter everyone like all the best musicians and uh how do you look at this album now if you listen to it if if you had listened to it i'll put it like that or, well, and... i don't listen to it but... <laughs> <laughs> although i did happen to hear one of the pieces the other day um because um we were going through some Reel to reel tapes, and there was a broadcast of, of, of. We must, I don't know, but this happened to come up. Edge of Time was on one of these tapes, and uh, so I heard a bit of um, uh, Songs for a Child, I think, oh, yeah. which was yeah. the trio with yeah. Art Thurman on saxophone and John on piano, of course. Um, but no, I, I mean, I think it wasn't until I, I worked with ECM that I felt that the voice was recorded in a sympathetic way. Okay. Um, and I, I don't know why, but I suppose um, when we did Edge of Time, I think I was considered like an instrument, which yeah. as I was sometimes, but I, I don't know. I think the recording techniques weren't as sophisticated then. And, and I wasn't, I was not singing in the way that I really liked then. Mm. I mean, no, I appreciate something, and I appreciate what I was doing was probably very um, unusual, definitely unusual for the time. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I I can't really listen to it and enjoy it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Well, how did you decide to, to do that, right? Because that was your debut as a band leader, right? Yeah. But how did that happen? Because it, the band is incredible. I mean, like, yeah. I mean, it's... Well, I won a poll, the Melody Maker poll. And I was already, I'd already made some recordings with Michael Garrick's sextet um, for a label called Argo, which was an offshoot of Decca. And they often did the spoken word, you know, they recorded poetry and things. 
but they recorded Michael's sextet and I had done an album with him. And suddenly I won this poll and I think Decker thought, well, <laughs> he's already on one of our, you know, she's already on our label. Okay, yeah, we'll give her, an, give her our own album. <laughs> and so I thought, right, I'm going to do, I'm going to involve as many of my friends and musicians mm. as possible. <laughs> and, and so and I got, so John Sermon did an arrangement of Erebus. Um, yeah. John Warren, who was around, had a great band in London and it was an arranger and, and he, he did Perkins Landing. And then John did something, which of course the bigger band things involved more of the musicians. And um, I don't know, we just, edge of time, I think we that, that piece we had already, I'd already been singing with John. Oh, okay. And, um, yeah, um, what else? When Enjoy This Day, that was a new, a new piece of John's and I don't know, it's what I did. So I, I always liked, uh, when I improvised, I, I used to like sometimes keeping the words, having some words to sit, to improvise over the tune rather than just yeah. being wordless. Um, and that's what I did on that piece. But I mean, it is, it is interesting, I, I know. And, and uh, yeah, and, and eventually other companies said after it was deleted, um, I think Decca realized their mistake because I think they recorded quite a few people, um, English groups yeah. at that time. And then they realized they weren't going to make the money that they thought they might make. So they, they deleted them. And um, well. so, and it was because of that that we were looking around for the opportunities seemed to diminish. And so, you know, John said, well, let's try to get an album with somebody else. And of course, we'd heard ECM stuff by then and um, of course loved it. And Kenny and then recorded New High. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. Um, so, and I think he had mentioned John, John Taylor, to Manfred. And so Manfred already knew about John and that he worked with Kenny. And, and John and I made a duo album, yeah. uh, not, not an album, a, a recording of, of P, duo pieces. And John said, I'm going to go and offer this to different record companies. And of course, ECM was top of the list. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and at that time, you could get an appointment. With Manfred, yeah. actually, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> at that time. But, um, and so he did. And, uh, and he just bought a synthesizer. I don't know if you want, needed to know all this, but I'm telling you anyway. No, please. I'm, I'm, you know, it's a, John and Kenny are two of my favorite composers of all time, really. I, I tell this to everyone. I mean, you know, that's why I'm like, you just... <laughs> You, you just go. Oh, you're right. Um, but uh, so and John had just got a synthesizer. The, the night before he was going with this recording that we had made, we'd gone into a studio and recorded various pieces um, of John's with my words and, and a standard, I think. But he, he, he got a loop going and he said uh, to me, look, just sing sing over this, just improvise something over this. And so I did, and he took that with him as well, this little recording he'd made. And it was when Man I mean, Manfred liked the other stuff, but when he heard this with the synthesizer, he said, I can hear a flugel with the voice. Oh, wow. And he said, why don't we get Kenny in as well? And we thought, wow, that's a fantastic <laughs> idea because we were working with him anyway. So that's how Azimuth happened. Azimuth happened, yeah. Wow, interesting. Yeah. Wow, but, yeah. But before that, you know, I was recording with Michael Garrick. We were doing Michael Garrick's songs, his compositions. And so there were no standards really on anything. I, did, I didn't, I was singing standards on gigs. Yeah. But, but I didn't re ever record any which is why later I tried to make up for it a bit by when I did like Song Like Weather with 
with John. Um, we recorded a few, like things yeah. like on Sunday and uh, I Love You Porgy, because I, I, I love the standards, but it, but I especially love the way he played them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you, you, you too had you, uh, amazing, amazing connection. Uh, the, the, speaking of Kenny and John, Mm. How did you get involved into that scene? Like in, let's say, I guess, mid 60s or late 60s, mm -hmm. or how, how, how did that happen for you? Well, I was at that time, I, I, I just went around and would ask if I could sit in, in um, places. There were lots of pubs in London where mm. they'd have a trio, say Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, you'd have mm. a piano, drums, trio, and they sometimes have a guest. Um, it was quite a common thing, really. Um, it was great, really. So I had no idea because I didn't go to any school because there weren't any schools then. Yeah. You know, that you, you, all you could do was to go and you know, buy records. Ask if you could sit in. Oh, yeah. And I did that, and I had a little repertoire of songs. And, and uh, sometimes they would say, oh, Okay, um, in two weeks' time, you know, we have a slot here. You could you could do a Saturday or something, and, and that's so I started to get work. And John happened to come along to one of these things. He had just come to London to work. He was working for the Inland Revenue um, as a tax officer, I think. And he came from he'd been living in Hastings. And he came to London, and he was he was playing, you know, of course, playing the piano, and uh, he asked if he could sit in at this pub. And I said, well, you have to ask those musicians because it's not my thing. So he sat in in the interval and played. I thought it sounded really good. And then he just said to me, if ever you need a, a piano player, this is my number. And I wrote it down and I didn't need a piano player though. You know, I, <laughs> it was every time I went anywhere for a gig, the trio was there, sure. but then, suddenly we found ourselves working that he got a job um, at the same pub where I worked on Friday and so immediately oh yeah I remember you you know and we and we immediately started rehearsing which people didn't do for those gigs you know you didn't rehearse yeah. you just went and played um, but we started and he just he was he'd been really influenced by Oscar Peterson but then he discovered Bill Evans, a pianist called Denny Zeitlin, he liked very much. Oh yeah, I love him, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, um, yeah. and he started to write his own things as well. So we started to rehearse. And in the meantime, and also Dave Holland would come along because mm. they found themselves um, in rooms in the same house. It wasn't a musician's house. But they got talking and Dave said, oh, I love Ray Brown. And John said, oh, I love Oscar Peterson. <laughs> and, um, so, uh, so he would come down and sit and play with us sometimes, which was great. And um, wow. of course, of course, that's before he was discovered by Miles Davis. And uh, that was a, it was a lot of fun. And, but also... Um, you see, I, did you know anything about John Stevens and the spontaneous? Yeah, sure, 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 sure. I, I, right. I have those records. I mean, yeah. Yeah, I love that stuff. Well, before he was playing free music, I met John. Um, I sat in somewhere, and he oh, said, wow. "I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell Ronnie Scott to give you an audition or ask him." And I said, "Oh, okay, well, thank you." Um, and he said, "But we'll need a trio. We need to get something together." So he asked Gordon Beck, who's a wonderful yeah. pianist, and Jeff Klein, bass player, if if we could rehearse. So we got together and we rehearsed oh, um, wow. some tunes. And um, he spoke to Ronnie Scott, and Ronnie said, "Oh yeah, we'll we'll sort something out." It took eight months before I, I got the audition. I only got it because I went in and I said, "Look." I'm sorry, but you did promise an audition and nothing's happened. So he said, oh, I, I promise, I promise I will fix up a date. Well, by the time this happened, John Stevens had discovered free music 
and he didn't want to play time. Oh, wow. <laughs> he only wanted to play free music. So, um, so he didn't do the audition, um, but uh, Gordon Beck said, don't worry, I, I've got a drummer. He's just come down from, uh, from up the north somewhere. And it was Tony Oxley. Really? Oh, man. Wow. Yeah. My, my audition trio was Jeff Klein, Gordon Beck and Tony Oxley. Tony Oxley. Wow. I love Tony playing. Yeah, yeah, me too. Yeah. I mean, it was wild, but I, I loved it. His sense of time is incredible. And um, so oh. Ronnie, Ronnie gave me uh, four weeks of work. We used to do that then. You got... You could have a month, and it was opposite Roland Kirk's group. Wow! Um, well, it wasn't. It was a group, an English English musicians playing with Roland Kirk. So that was, I mean, four weeks. Can you imagine? It's like I didn't know. <laughs> I met Gary. I met Gary Boyle, the guitar player, who I worked with eventually with Mike Westbrook after that, and. He, he said, I said, did we meet? He said, yeah, I met you when you were at Ronnie Scott's. He said, but you probably wouldn't remember. You were on another planet. <laughs> I, was, I was on cloud nine playing, playing with these musicians. Uh, but by the time we, the gig happened, the four weeks, Jeff had gone to America. Tony had gone, I don't know where. So I did it with a... a, a lovely drummer called Alan Ganley. He used to be very helpful, nice man, a good drummer and good arranger, and a bass player called Ken Baldock. I mean, they're all dead now. Mm. But, uh, <laughs> but anyway, it was such an experience, four weeks. Yeah, it's... You know, really, five nights, yeah, six nights a week, yeah. Wow, that's... Saturday. And um, so that was a real helpful thing. But because I knew John Stevens, um, even though he wasn't playing time anymore, he said, <laughs> he started these free groups and he said, come and join us. So oh, wow. uh, he didn't mind that I was still seeing time. <laughs> so, so I went and joined his groups on a Saturday, he'd get people together and there'd be all kinds of musicians there. And Kenny was one of them. And um, and I think Dave used to, Dave Holland used to come to those things as well. And I had no idea what was going to happen. I'd just go to this place and then people would start playing. I think, well, I have to do something. I have to sing. And it's very, very good uh, kind of training in a way because you, you, have to, you have to come up with your own ideas yeah. and try to relate them to something you've heard. But, I mean, sometimes you can imagine that complete cacophony of yeah, noise exactly. sound. But, um, and Kenny never said anything I mean he just played so quiet you know but he then sometime later said would you like to do a broadcast with my big band and I said yeah, well yeah he said I'll arrange a standard for you and he did he arranged a, I'll never be the same I think he arranged oh. um, and I, I'm told that this is not the order of things, you know, that I remember it as him uh, doing this on the first broadcast. And then the next one, I turned up and he had me written as an instrument. I mm. you know, yeah. He had a broadcast and I came there. I think I may have sung one. I did write words to one of his songs from Windmill Tilter. Do you know that? Album? Yeah, sir. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's um, such Don an Man underrated album. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. I, I was in sure. love with that album, I and mean, before I met him, yeah, it's like sixty-nine or something. Yeah, yeah we, we bought that album, and I played it over and over. Yeah, and I wrote words to "Don No More," um, and I sang that with him on one broadcast. But suddenly, I was in. I was written in <laughs> as an instrument, and it just had have um, with second alto here. Or, I mean, it was completely, well, it wasn't completely new singing without words because yeah. I did that with Michael Garrick. He was the first person, I think, that asked me um, to sing. Oh, God. I mean, I've been around such a long time that it goes, <laughs> there's so many 
paths that I've to describe how they all linked up. Yeah, you know? sure. I, um, I can imagine. Yeah. That's... You know, when I, when I was in the, oh, I suppose about 65 or something, I was running a club in the East End of London, which I eventually found out was owned by the Cray twins. Well, you don't know them, but no, no. no notorious gangsters. And, <laughs> yes, and okay. I, I didn't know that then. And <laughs> we were allowed to use this place uh, once a week, you know, this club. And so there were, we had a trio. I didn't, I got together with friends and um, we invited guests and Ian Carr, the trumpet player, was one of the guests and he said, you should sing with the new jazz orchestra. So I said, okay, great. Um, and uh, I'll introduce you to Neil Ardley, which he did. Yeah. And um, Neil, of course, transcribed a lot of the Gil Evans stuff. It was, it was a beautiful orchestra, new jazz orchestra, and I've never sung with that many instruments before, you know, it was, uh, I don't yeah, know, it's beautiful. Yeah. experience to suddenly have all this noise, this sound behind you. Um, but Michael Garrick was the pianist then, and he said, oh, I've written some songs, would you like to look at them? So I took the songs away, learnt them, and I went to one of his sextet gigs, and he said, oh, sit in, sing one of the songs. So I did. And I went to sit down and he said, no, just join in on the next piece. Oh, well. the next piece I didn't know, but it was like one called. So that was all right. And it was uh, yeah, probably an odd time signature, like 10. Eight, <laughs> yeah, <that's true>. <laughs> he was, he always, always did things at odd time signatures. Um, but so I joined in. I just took a solo, a wordless solo. And then he said at the end of the evening, you know, he had two saxophones and trumpet as front line. One of the saxophones is leaving. Why don't you join the band and, and sing those, sing his part? Mm. You know, his well. part. And I thought, wow, this is, you know, such a, a chance to be part of music, which is what I always wanted to do. I mm. always wanted to be a part of a sound. Um, I mean, I, 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 that's what I still love, but I still love singing, of course, singing a song on my own. Yeah. But um, I always had this idea, it would be great. And I was very happy to blend into another sound. Yeah. And that was the start of it. And so, of course, I had done that. And whether Kenny knew that I did that, I suppose he did. I don't know, but he started to write me into his big band as an instrument. Yeah, that's its own, um, its own kind of uh, problems. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> how was he like as a as a band leader, Kenny? I mean, like you know, like m music for large and small ensembles for me, it's like you know, that's like who's who plays on that of UK jazz. I mean, mm. and the music, it's like I think that's one of the best records on ECM in the last. I mean, ever, I guess. But how, how did was working like with Kenny? I mean, like. Well, he never really said much. <laughs> he, you know, it, uh, people have asked me before, did he tell you how he wanted you to sing anything? No. Oh, and he okay. never asked about keys or anything. He just wrote the thing and suddenly he might say, oh, sorry, it's a bit high. <laughs> <laughs> but you just, I mean, the, my problem was <laughs> that he never wrote in keys, as you know. <laughs> it's never a key signature. Yeah, yeah. Because it moved around so much into All the different time, yeah. harmonic areas. So um, I would listen to something, and I'd know that I'd be, I'd have say sixteen bars rest, and then I have to come in on a B or something. Well, oh. I might be with somebody, but it, if it was with him, then okay, I could hear that. Yeah. Oh, the lead thing but if it was like the second alto or something and I think well it's one of you know it's one of these notes that fits but you have to find the right one so I would listen sometimes to that section and I would think well what do I hear what's the dominant note that I hear when it comes to an end a section where I'm not singing and then I'd run to the piano and I'd play it because I don't have perfect pitch and Say, ah, ah, that's an F. I can hear an F. 
oh, all throughout okay. that section. So I've got to come in on a B so I, I can work that out. Yeah. So that I know I'm in the right place because sometimes you could pick a note which fitted and it fitted for about three or four notes and then suddenly you were about the fourth. <laughs> yeah, that's so <laughs> um, But so I had to work out my own, my own little help, you know, how to get, because he never, he never said anything. He never, the most he would say was, oh, you sounded good tonight. <laughs> <laughs> And I, but I guess you, everybody that worked with him knew that if you were there, it was because he wanted you to be yeah. there for something yeah. that you had, whatever it was. But he was, oh, God, so extraordinary. And, and I learned so much, I think, from listening to him, singing, blending. Like, it was wonderful when you had to sing with him. Yeah, I can just imagine. I have goosebumps now when you're yeah. telling this. Really, just, <laughs> I imagine this, you know, like this, yeah. It's beautiful. Yeah, because yeah. you, you, you know, you just, and I, I think I had to sort of try to match his sound, which is what I just automatically wanted to do, because as I say, I never really wanted the voice to be out front, the, a voice above yeah. the orchestra. I always felt that in a way it should be part of the music, uh, that kind of music. And um, so that's what I was trying to do. And I think, I think it taught me a lot about how to sing a melody, how to produce a note. Yeah. 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 Really yeah that's why Azimuth sounded so great, I think, because it was, you know, you were like a team in a way. It was not a... Yeah, it wasn't like three voices in a way. Yeah, I don't know. It's, it's like a unit. I mean, it was, yeah. yeah, but like it's it sounds so such as a unit, you know, it's like yeah. one dough in a way. It's so beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, anyway, I, I, in fact, I mean, the, the time I started to find my voice acceptable to listen to <laughs> was when we recorded first ECM album with Azimuth. Yeah. Because I think by then I'd I'd played a lot with Kenny anyway, and I heard his sound and I, which I loved, apart from everything else that I loved about his playing. I mean, the, the, the fact that you never knew where a phrase would finish up, you, you're following it, and, and it suddenly goes around a corner and finishes yeah, something that's... else. Um, but it just, I think I'd, my sound had improved because I was used to singing in unison with him or, you know, listening to him. Do you mind if I make Okay. Um, and... Uh, yeah, so... How, how, how was it like with, with you guys when you played together live? On, you know, like, I mean, when I listened to the first one, like Siren Song and O oh and oh, The Tunnel, yeah. like when you played those tunes live, I guess there was a lot of space. I mean, yeah. when you did tours, music probably changed every night, right? I mean, how was... Yeah, I suppose so. I mean, we, 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 didn't, we didn't think, oh, we're going to do it differently every night. But mm. I think each of us were the sort of people that wanted something fresh you know um yeah. didn't like to do the same thing the same way all the time i mean there's there's nothing wrong with that if it works sure. but i think that the three of us obviously didn't really want to do that you know didn't want to unless there was something that that really didn't need anything else doing with it you know there were some songs which you you don't really want to yeah sure to pull around too much but um but it was i forgot what your question was um what was it like yeah um, especially on tours i mean when you guys played like oh, on tours, yeah oh yeah. Uh, yeah well it was obviously we couldn't um there wasn't the overdubbing facility which of course we did quite a lot on some of the tracks yeah. on the, the azimuth recordings because we could um but of course you couldn't do anything like that live but but we just did we just had the same attitude i think and uh you know john would start playing sometimes and kenny and i wouldn't know which tune we were going to play next to look at each other and until <laughs> ah, 
oh yeah, it's going to be this one. Because we, we sometimes didn't work out a complete program, but of course it's always led from the piano. It was the, uh, because it's the, the harmonic instrument. So yeah. he, well, it was, it, was, it was his group and it was mostly his music. We did play some of Kenny's too, but yeah. it was mostly John's music. Um, yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Uh, Norma, Nor just not to take too much of your time, but uh, right. I just wanted to ask you, like, uh, you know, you, you've you've been such an important part of the British jazz scene and European jazz scene. And then there's like in your discography, I listen to the record Songs and Lullabies with Fred. And, oh, uh, yeah. how, you know, I love Fred's playing. He's, again, one of those Yes. <laughs> jewels in the jazz world. And uh, how did that cooperation happen, actually? Because it's quite rare that you played with did yeah, albums right. with Americans, but how did with that one with Fred happen? Um, well, there was a, an agent over here called Alwyn Richards, who used to bring Fred over to do a lot of solo tours to England. Um, you know, when, when he was in Europe, he's often in Europe, still is. Um, but he he would come to England and do a tour. And I think he'd done maybe three solo tours and she decided that really it was, would be better if she varied it a bit, you know, because perhaps it would be possible to get more concerts. Yeah. So I don't know how it happened, but I was asked to join with Kenny and uh, oh, wow. she called Paul Clavis. Yeah. So that, that, <laughs> Funny enough, uh, Fred started a group with just that lineup when he went back um, to America again. Um, very nice group he had. I've forgotten what he called it now, but anyway, it was that lineup anyway. Um, but and so we had to find tunes. So I, I had recordings by Fred. So I listened and I thought, oh, I'll try to write words to a couple of these pieces, mm. and I did. And he liked he liked them, and uh, I mean Fred is very particular, and so he should be. You know, so it's yeah. his music, but you don't, you know, he doesn't automatically say, "Oh yes, that's that's nice," and because he said to me, "Oh, you don't know how many people have tried to write words to that particular tune, which was Song of Life, um, Heart Song, it was called originally," um, and he obviously hadn't liked them, but. <laughs> <laughs> you like these so we did this little tour and uh, it was it was very enjoyable and um we did another one and i wrote some more words to some more pieces and then fred said well why don't we record and we were going to record a mixture of his songs and standards and i did go there but we tried and but there was something he didn't like about the piano or something in the studio so we abandoned that and he said, well, we'll make another date, come back and we'll try again. So we found another date later. And in the meantime, he'd written a lot more pieces, which were yet to be recorded, like A Wish or Valentine. Um, and he was sending them to me. His wow. Playing, oh, wow. Playing, playing the piano, just send me a piano version and the music. Oh, really? and, and I came up with words. And... Um, and also wrote more words to more of his pieces I discovered on his recording. And so we just said, oh, well, let's just do your, you know, your music and my words. And then he said, oh, I'll ask Gary, to, Gary Burton, to, to be on a couple of tracks, which was wonderful. Um, but it's very, very hard because uh, I, Fred is a very, very special kind of player well as you you know yeah, you yeah sure no um like perfect really the way he plays yeah. is yeah. perfect um especially on the standards well yeah, everything that he plays it's it's kind of perfect um which in a way i wasn't used to but i i just sang the songs i sang my words and I did well on it. Of course, I do improvise a bit in places, but it was really about the compositions, the songs, and the words. Yeah, yeah. And, um, I know. I think it. I think it's lovely. It's a lovely album. Yeah, it's it's beautiful. 
Yeah. yeah. But strange enough, I think some of the reviews didn't seem to like my words a lot. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a different story. <laughs> Re- reviews like uh, <laughs> funny. Fred, like, Fred liked them, so that was all right. <laughs> <laughs> he's he's a good critic. <laughs> yeah, uh, he's a great guy. I, 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 I love Fred. He's such an amazing player and a nice guy. And really beautiful. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah. Cool. Great, Norma. Th- thank you so much. I will. I will not take more of your time. I mean, uh, that's all uh, right. I mean, I don't know. I just have talked and talked. Oh no, it's beautiful. You you know, it's I, I love this. It's just. It's about you, you know, because I'm a fan of music and I want to listen to you tell your part of your stories or part of your... Yeah, yeah, so beautiful. So Well, thank you for asking me. (laughs) Yeah, it it makes... It's nice for me because then, you know, I listen to the music and now I have some of your insights and it's always for me really cool then to put on... Doctor Jazz. Doctor Jazz.